Hello and welcome once again to BipolarCast. This is a podcast by myself and Matt Bazuki where we talk to people uh, who are using ketogenic metabolic therapy to treat psychiatric conditions uh, with a focus on bipolar disorder. And today we're really excited because we have um, two of the people who really were the earliest and most influential people in making this happen for epilepsy. And we're on a sort of early uh, part of metabolic psychiatry at the moment where we're doing uh, pilot studies and case series and so forth. And um, but we're very fortunate to speak to Denise and Beth who've been through this with epilepsy and seen the whole process unfold with how to deliver ketogenic metabolic therapy. And so uh, a couple of quick intros. Beth is a world-renowned ketogenic expert, clinician and speaker. She's a registered and certified dietitian and nutritionist. She's also an active member of the American College of Nutrition, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Dietitians in Functional Medicine. For over 30 years, she has coached medical professionals, patients, and families through safe and effective use of nutritional ketosis for neurological disorders, certain cancers, and other metabolic-based conditions that require careful formulation and laboratory surveillance. Alongside her private practice, she is the primary consultant for the Charlie Foundation. Her work applies cutting-edge science to improving health outcomes. Denise Potter is a registered dietitian, uh, registered dietitian nutritionist for 31 years. For the past 15 years, she has focused on ketogenic medical nutrition therapy. She has been privileged to speak to train and educate professionals and individuals around the world on therapy to ketogenic therapies. She strives to pr provide client-centered, personalized therapy, counseling, and education. <clears throat> Denise has a passion for helping underserved populations benefit from the ketogenic diet, and she authored The Migraine Diet, a ketogenic meal plan for headache relief. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yes. So... So, um, so Denise, you have a history with um, Matt with ketogenic diet. Um, would you guys like to share a bit about how you started working together? Yeah, absolutely. Go. Do you want to start, Matt? Yeah. So Denise was my dietitian when I first went on the diet in 2021, and I was working with Chris Palmer. And I was working with Denise, and so basically, my mom and I kind of we all put together this little team where. It, you know, my psychiatrist was on board. Denise was helping me with the diet and manage the macro, the macronutrients and the foods and what I was going to eat and all this type of stuff. And Chris was um, guiding me through the whole process. And so we tried a bunch of different stuff. When I first um, went on the diet, we were trying different like macro makeups. We were trying higher fat. I think we we're trying lower fat and I was eating a lot of calories. So eventually we just had to, we had to calculate for that, but it was an interesting process because I really didn't, I understood what keto was when I went in. I knew it was a high fat, moderate protein diet, super low carb, like virtually no carb, but I didn't know exactly which types of fats I should be eating and what was going to be easiest and what was going to make sense for me. And I think that's where Denise kind of was guiding me through the whole process. Yeah. So, and as we, as we did that, sometimes we start out trying to be just real specific for me. I think the very first thing you probably did was, hey, let's cut down on sweets, right? Let's cut down on sweets and the really big carbs. And I know you said you lived in an environment of pizza every, <laughs> all over, you know, and, and just a lot of um, college age, you know, guys around just eating it, you know, kind of a typical American diet. So just starting to cut back that a little bit and then moving toward an actual calculated diet for a period of time where we use keto diet calculator, which is a program Beth created to very specifically figure out how much fat do we need? How much protein do we need? And how many carbs can we get by with? We want to give as many carbs as we can, but it's, it's not many. So we want to maximize the nutrition. And in that, you know, then we found out, wow, how many, again, what was the calorie level, what, what were all those levels? And then we could calculate the meals very specifically. And you had some help. You can tell a little bit about um, how you're getting your food. Cause that was, you know, pretty cool. And anyway, so you did that. And then we knew what your ketones were on those levels, you know, on that ratio of fat to protein and carb, what did your ketones do? And so we walked through that and then we can kind of tell a little bit about that. And then we'll kind of say what it's evolved to. Totally. I had, I had someone cooking the meals. So we were really like, it was very, very um, closely monitored at, initially in terms of like what uh, the macronutrient makeup was, how much protein I was eating, how many carbs I was eating. And it was really low at, and at first. And we, and I was tracking my ketones twice a day for the first few months. So I was watching my ketones and in the evening and I was looking and I was usually like 1.5 to even in the high twos, millimolar, depending on what was going on. 
especially because I was exercising a lot. And so we were able to watch and like, you know, we watched them and I had, I went through a lot of like periods where it was tricky, where one at one point I got COVID and my ketones just dropped, or I just had ketoacidosis and I had to drink like a little apple juice because my ketones were so high. So it was kind of a process, a learning process for me, but we did get it dialed in and we, I learned about all these different foods that I could be eat that I could eat that were just like super high fat, healthy fat foods, macadamia nuts, MCT oil, avocados, like all these different foods and eating a lot of meat, a lot of fatty fish, a lot of fatty meat um, and vegetables. And really like, I think the t- biggest takeaway for, for me when I first went on the diet was that it was so helpful to have a wealth of good hearty keto food available for me in my fridge. So that if I was ever hungry, I could just go and grab a meal and pop it in the microwave and then eat it. And I was so, so lucky to have had someone cooking for me. I mean, I was really lucky. So that made it easier. You know, when my friends were eating what they were eating, I could just go grab a meal and eat it. And, and generally my, um, my cravings for sweets, like started to disappear the, the further and further I got along in the diet as the months progressed. One thing you mentioned, and I know Beth uses this a lot too, is you use a lot of MCT oil and, and that helps us to get great ketones or good ketones at a much lower ratio, you know, allowing a little more protein, allowing a little more carb than, than you can get away with without the MCT oil. And I know you were pretty liberal with that and that was really helpful. I know Beth, but I don't know if you want to add anything about MCT. I know you use it a lot also with your patients. Yeah, actually, uh, I use MCT even before I have people make any other changes, um, specifically for people that are super picky eaters. And I'll even say most specifically for people with autism who have a very, very limited diet. It's a simple thing to introduce, you know, a small amount with each meal. And then um, they often find that they're just thinking clear or more calm or parents will notice if it's a child that they're just more calm just with that one little change so it's really a nice easy um, change to make and then you know what what people might not know about mct oil is that it comes from coconuts it's simply filtered from coconut oil um, and it uh, is a little bit better at burning or making ketones than other oils and um, there is, it's also tasteless and odorless. So it's not like you have to get used to a, a new food. It's, it's like greasy water, I think is probably the easiest way someone told me, de- described it this way, but you could easily mix it into food. The best way that I have found people enjoy it is mixing it into salad dressing because salad dressing is already an oil, usually you no know, extra virgin olive oil um, and a little bit of like apple cider vinegar and then some MCT oil or a lot of people just like drinking it as a little um, uh, shot glass. Um, a lot of teenagers that I've worked with like it that way because they think it's kind of cool that they get to drink a shot before they eat their meal, but it's just pure oil, tasteless and odorless, get that into their system and then they can eat the rest of their meal. So yeah, it's, it's one of those sort of uh, easy little fixes to start with, and then we can adjust it up. And, and the main thing people need to know is you can't just start drinking loads of this because it'll probably go through your system like a bullet. You know, it, it is easily absorbed, so it can um, go right through your digestive tract in less than two minutes, <laughs> which sends you running to the bathroom. Um, so there's, there's caveats with it, but it is, it's a nice little, you know, easy thing to do, um, or to augment the diet. And there is an MCT oil diet that has special guidelines for it, um, that was designed, uh, in the seventies. Um, so it, that's where it comes from. The whole notion comes from that therapy. And that's exactly what I was doing. I would get, I was using a lot of liquigen back in the day and I would just put it in a little like third of a cup measuring cup and I would just take it down like a shot it was very fun I really liked uh, throughout the like the course of the the adjustment when I was first on the diet I really liked experimenting with like fun ways to get a lot of fat in my diet so you know I would like uh, ask for 
uh, melted butter when I was in Mexico with my family and I would just like take down the melted butter. I was doing all kinds of stuff. It was very fun. That's fun. One, I'll just say that, that the um, liquigen is an emulsified MCT oil. So it's half water and half fat. And it's just real easy to mix with things. So I like it for that reason. Um, but I'll just say there are a lot of emulsified products on the market that also have carbs and liquigen doesn't have carbs in it. And some of the other products that are um, newer on the market, they have carbohydrate in them, which I think is kind of not really helpful when you have a fat that you've added some carbohydrate to. So I'm not really fond of those just to clarify the other ones. And there's another one called, um, just to give fair, um, fair, um, whatever marketing it is um, beta quick. So those two are two that are, they don't have carbs in them. So it's, it's not, it's not beta quick. I apologize. I think it's called K quick now, but anyway, so, but yeah, that's, I think, man, while you're talking about that, it'd be interesting to, I think travel is one of the harder parts of being on a ketogenic therapy. And really when you're on a medical ketogenic therapy and it's not, it's not like you're just doing this for fun and you, you really need to keep those numbers up and it travel. So Tell about your travel a little bit and what was hard about it. It's really challenging. My ketones always dropped when I traveled. And I remember on that Mexico trip, they were down to like 0.3 and I could not get them up. And I just didn't know what it was. Um, obviously, I didn't have, I wasn't eating my normal food. And even though a, I literally felt like I was eating fish and avocados and butter, and that's literally all I was eating. Like, I, I don't know what it was. I, I think there's some sort of physiological impact of the travel that affects ketone levels. Mm -hmm. um, because that was my experience whenever I traveled is my ketones dropped. And I didn't always have, I, I, I didn't have like weird symptoms usually. Usually I was okay. Mm -hmm. But it made me nervous, you know, like, especially on that trip to Mexico, going to Mexico and having my ketones drop from two to 0.3 and being in the sun all day and, you know, it was like April or something. And it's just like this recipe for hypomanic, manic disaster. So that didn't happen to me, obviously. And I was lucky and I was really careful and I was watching my mood, but travel is, travel is tricky. And that, you know, I think the best thing that I've done over the last couple of years is really just um, cut my calories when I travel and enter like a semi-fast, especially if it's only if it's, if it's only a three or four day trip, like I went to New Orleans with my friends recently and I probably ate 70% the calories that I would normally eat, but I just ate chicken and almonds and just dropped them. And, and cutting the calories for me is a pretty bulletproof way of ensuring that I will stay in ketosis if, or, or closer to the level of ketosis that I have been in if I really want to. And really, um, it, it, it mimics a, an extended fast, which is the easiest way to put yourself in ketosis. So that's one, been one of my best strategies. Mm -hmm. so, I know, oh, go ahead. I anyway. know Beth has, I know when you travel, you have some tricks. I think you've told me, like, don't you fast sometimes on a travel day? Just kind of like Matt was saying. Yes, I just got back from Hong Kong and, um, you know, you're, you're flying for 24 hours. Um, and so what I do is pretty much, uh, I'll take a meal that they show me and I'll just eat the protein out of it and the butter, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. not a roll on the ice cream and all the carby stuff that they have there. Um, or I'll skip one or two of the meals, but yeah, I'll eat very little. And that's how I can keep my ketones up because, um, you know, they just can't, they cannot service somebody like me on an airplane unless I'm in first class. And I think even then it would be hard. Um, but that same thing, Matt, it just doing that semi fasting is key. And it also helps with jet lag too, I have found. I have, I have one more travel tip is when you take a bag of macadamia nuts through security, get it out of your bag because I've been stopped so many times. Apparently it looks like a bomb and, <laughs> and, and I'll get searched and they're digging through my stuff. And then they pull out these macadamia nuts like, ha, <laughs> it's leave me alone. It's macadamia nuts. Anyway. So now I get it out because I usually carry a bag with me. So I get them out, I put them on the tray and everybody's happy. And then I don't get frisked nearly as often. So same with the gram scale. If you're traveling with a gram scale, you may as well just put it out with your computer because it looks like a drug scale. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> it's amazing. Oh, the sleep this diet. That's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um yeah, this is incredible because um Matt started working with you on ketogenic diet and this then, so Chris had, I guess, put you guys in touch and then you had done this diet and then Matt uh, got better from his bipolar symptoms in keto. And this is leading to this resurgence in interest and in research and because of um, the Buzuki Foundation that are now uh, funding trials and doing making materials and spreading word about this. So it's very exciting. And, and you guys saw this happen uh, with epilepsy um, through the Charlie Foundation and through all your work um uh, treating people with epilepsy I, I wondered in in all the time that you treat people with mitochondrial disorders and epilepsy and all these kinds of conditions that keto can be helpful for have you always seen these mood effects uh, have they always been kind of under recognized and um, what, what kind of mood effects would you see in people with comorbidities or, or just with symptoms of depression um Denise? Oh, go ahead. oh go ahead sorry yeah uh, so that is kind of the amazing piece of working with us for so long is that, you know, both Denise and I actually have very similar backgrounds. We started out in pediatric epilepsy, um, but people with epilepsy usually don't just have epilepsy. They have other medical issues, um, cognitive, you know, some of them had cognitive delays, um, physical uh, mobility issues, maybe cerebral palsy. Um, autism, um, depression was common, especially older kids and adults. And so we would often notice that these other symptoms would get better. And sometimes those sympt the symptoms of those conditions would get better and the epilepsy wouldn't. <laughs> so people, for example, I had worked with a lot of kids that had autism and epilepsy and, and the autism would always get better. The kids would get brighter, more attention span, you know, more focus, and maybe have the same number of seizures, but the parents would not want to give up, give up because they realized that this, they were onto something. So um, many of those children that I worked with years ago are on some very liberal form of keto just because they've been wanting to maintain that, you know, that degree of improvement. Um, so yeah, and, and depression, when I started working with older people that had epilepsy, and I would say 90% of them have some degree of depression, that that often got better, and sleep got better, and energy level got better, which of course, you know, those are hallmarks of uh, symptoms of depression. So, um, you know, we, we saw this years and years ago, and now it's getting attention, finally, the attention that it deserves. And, um, I, I am just like thrilled beyond ever that there's great attention to it, um, largely because of your, you, Matt, um, you could take credit for it <laughs> in your family, but, you know, Charlie's the one that we give credit for, for epilepsy, because if there wasn't Charlie Abrams, we wouldn't be using it for epilepsy. It was really a forgotten diet. And it was because of his epilepsy that his parents were like, you know, let's do this. We, where do we go to do this? Because we haven't tried this. We tried everything else. Where can we go? And that was the ticket. You know, he was seizure free in two weeks, within two weeks of trying the diet. If, if you look at a, a graph of the PubMed studies published on ketogenic diet and epilepsy, there's, there's almost nothing throughout the whole 1900s. And then on the, almost to the date that um, they did the Dateline NBC special on Charlie Abrams' epilepsy, you can just see this exponential curve start, with, which is still continuing to this day. And, and this is now happening through Matt's story and the Buzuki group funding these. So it's, it's really like a parallel history. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on today, because we can learn from what happened uh, with epilepsy about ketogenic diet. What, what were the road marks? What were the things that need to be overcome? And I know that a, a huge part of this is training dietitians and uh, bringing up a new generation of dietitians. And I know that's something you're both very interested in. So what advice would you give for this metabolic psychiatry moving starting, having seen the whole journey of this with epilepsy? What are the kind of key things that we need to focus on and what are the roadblocks that have been run into that we could avoid? Just a small question. <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll make one comment first. And Beth's been here from the very beginning. So then I'll let you jump in. But um, somehow, somehow, you know, as and I know the research is, you know, being funded and working, they're working really hard to have robust research. And I'm very confident that 
that the studies are going to show out, you know, very, you know, similar and, and Matt, maybe you're going to be like the Charlie, like, whoa, this is, you know, even the best of obviously the best effect you could get. And maybe um, a percentage of people will get 70% as, as well as you have, you know, who knows what those numbers are going to show, but I'm very confident they're going to be very good with well done research. And so, but as we do this, we've somehow we've got to get this in front of the physicians immediately as quickly as possible because we are still fighting then epilepsy and I can't even begin to express, express the frustration that we're still arguing with neurologists about the efficacy of ketogenic therapies for epilepsy a hundred years later. So I'm going to stop right or I won't stop. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, we can get in our soapbox about how underutilized keto is for epilepsy. And um, it, it, I mean, it's so unfortunate. And I think we feel like we're batting our heads against the wall. But, you know, on, on the positive side, Denise and I have trained thousands now of mostly dietitians, uh, but also physicians and nurses. And um, we are doing since, uh, since our trainings went virtual. So we used to go fly into house hospitals, spend a, you know, a night or two in a city and do a full day training. And then we started going outside of the U S and we've been all over the world doing these trainings. And then when COVID hit, um, we had stopped that. So we quickly got together a virtual, um, program, which, um, really caused some blood, sweat and tears between the two of us, because we were new at this, <laughs> not a training, but doing a virtual platform. So we got it going and uh, we've had several hundred people that have gone through it within this first year. And uh, we were just talking right before this interview and um, our, uh, our ratings are quite high. I think our 90%, 95% of our ratings are five out of five. So we know that people are, you know, enjoying them and learning a lot. And um, Hopefully we can get to more people, but yeah, we've got to get this turned around and we're so happy that the mental health world is bringing new attention to it because that's going to help anybody with epilepsy. And we, we both have worked with way beyond epilepsy, other neurological disorders, migraine headache and autism and um, dementia and so forth. But um, we just, we just know um, and trust that this movement is, is picking up speed and you know, within 10 years, I think every hospital in our country is going to have some kind of a, the ability to provide services. Why do the two of you think the medical community has been so unwilling to accept this as a viable treatment? It's, there's, there's no, you can't brand or you can try to brand ketogenic diet, right? It's, it's difficult to, to brand and bring a diet to, and, and maybe that's what we need to do. Right. Um, but how do you make a medical therapy, a therapy, you can't sell it at the store. I mean, you can, again, products are trying, but it's just not the same as, as a, as a medication. And it's not as easy as a medication to take, but yet the side effects are are, are minimal, you know, minimal and, and virtually can be, can be none and, and minimal when done well. So, yeah, I mean, that's, well, Beth, can I expand on that? Yeah. And I think part of it, you know, the education piece of course is essential, but if we think of somebody who has diabetes or cystic fibrosis, like diet is the number one treatment for them. And that has not been, you know, the trajectory for mental health, but that's what we're working on changing it. It's like everybody who has been diagnosed with a mental health concern should know that what they eat is affecting brain health. Um, so once we get that proven through research that Matt's family is helping to fund, <laughs> that can be, you know, that is going to be the standard of care is that just like cystic fibrosis, just like diabetes, just like kidney disease, heart disease, there is a dietary component that every person deserves to know about. So, so in a way, are you saying that because you can't monetize this, you can't, you know, it's, it's a diet, it's not a pill that you can sell to someone or advertise, is this the fundamental issue or is it that um, in, you know, say in like the CME courses, 
it's difficult to get people on board with learning about this. Um, what is what do you feel is the kind of root of the the problem um, in getting uh, psychiatrists interested in using? Well, I mean, to take the epilepsy example, why are not more neurologists taking an interest? Is there a lack of kind of CME training, or is it that they're not signing up to the CME training, or is it because there's a more fundamental problem that you just can't advertise and sell this in some way? Well, it's, it's one, it's lack of training when you can take it all the way back to medical schools where there, there may or may not even be one nutrition class. So nutrition's absolutely under, you know, underutilized in, in the, or under you know, represented in the training. And then from there, when you get to up to some of the big associations in the medical community, medical field, those are highly sponsored and run by drug companies, right? They're, they're providing the finances for their annual meetings and for things. So that probably influences what they may talk about at the meetings. It can be difficult to get ketogenic diet into some of these meetings and in front of physicians. Um, and respectfully done. So that's, it's something that people have been working on behind the scenes and that's been to different things. And I have colleagues that are, they go to American Epilepsy Society meetings that are presenting posters and posters on ketogenic therapies and trying to um, get that in. Um, over, I was going to plug for um, Phoenix Children's Hospital. They're working very hard to, con every, last three years, I think they've been at AES to, to prevent, present posters and put keto in front of the neurologist. I think the reality is we have, I'm optimistic that when you have a treatment that works as well as this treatment does, maybe not for every single person, but far better than any of the meds we get prescribed in a lot of cases. Like for me, I got prescribed dozens of psychiatric medications. Some worked okay. Zyprexa would work as an anti-manic for me when I needed it, but there was no like long lasting, um, medication that I took on a regular basis that allowed me to live well. Mm -hmm. And like keto has allowed me to do that. So I, I think when we have a treatment like this, that could work for so many people combined with such a horrific, abject mental health crisis, mm -hmm. you know, in this country and others, like there's a supply and demand effect. Like it has to take effect, especially when you have a burgeoning group of young doctors who are coming out of medical school who maybe haven't been indoctrinated with the, uh, the mm -hmm. you know, diet doesn't matter philosophy, who like really, really want to make people better. I'm hopeful that the next five or 10 years, we're going to see a massive shift. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we will. And I think now, because, because and it's been, it's not like the internet's new, but because of, you know, people's ability to research and learn and find things out and self-educate, um, you know, we're as, as clients of, the, of these physicians, we're not standing for that, you know, the fact that they don't know about something. And so it's, I think it's putting a higher demand on the, on the physicians to say, wow, look at these studies. And when someone comes to me, they'll say, have you seen this study? I'm like, oh my gosh, no, please. Where is it? Send me the link. You know, I want to know uh, because I don't want all my patients to know more than me. Right. So I think that pressure that we, people are continuing, continuing to apply to the physicians it is going to help. And like you said, I love, I love the younger doctors and the next generation coming up because they, that their mind, they're just learning and growing and, and far more open. So there's the, there's the science piece, there's the trials that need to happen to get um, doctors to prescribe the metabolic therapy. There's the uh, training of dietitians, there's the medical education. And what other things can you identify in the trajectory of epilepsy that led to the much more widespread adoption of ketogenic metabolic therapy. I know that the Charlie Foundation did a lot of um, training materials that you're involved in uh, developing training for dietitians uh, pro and promotional videos. Even for, I think they reached out to parents, didn't they, quite a lot. Uh, they were often reaching out to parents of children with epilepsy, and this was influential. Are there any other uh, kind of strategies that we could use in metabolic to bring attention to this? Well, one of, one of the very uh, fundamental um, pieces in the healthcare world is to have a billing code because the billing code is what gets uh, to the insurance company to reimburse for services. And so there are billing codes for diabetes diet education, cystic fibrosis diet education, kidney disease diet education, and so on and so forth. There isn't one for ketogenic diet therapy for epilepsy, for example. 
There is a general billing code that some hospitals will use that like a nutrition therapy code that they can use. And they are often using it just to track usage. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually bring in any reimbursement. But those billing codes um, need quite a bit of uh, negotiation with insurers to get um, set up. And it might be, it's probably different in, uh, in the Scotland, in the UK where you are, Ian. Um, I know it's different in Canada, but here in the US, this is what our system requires. The other, to take that one further, Beth, and I'm, I'm, I don't have any influence over this, but I feel passionate about it is inside the hospitals when the dietitians actually go to the rooms and they work with someone, which would be out actually very key when you have these inpatient facilities that I hope are providing ketogenic therapies. Um, there's no charge for a hospital dietitian. They're just a room, they're included in the room charge, which equates to um, less respect, less salary or things. And, and just it just doesn't equate to something that's a very integral part of importance of someone's admission. And you know, when physical therapy comes to your room, you're gonna get a bill. When occupational therapy comes, of course, you get a bill and so on. And so when nutritional therapy comes to your room, there needs to be a charge for that. And again, right onto the billing code, because it is incredibly important. It's part of their healing, part of their care. And that's a, a whole nother layer. And it's big. I mean, it's got to come from, from way up. But that, I think, is another piece of that. As we hopefully get billing codes in there, there need to be inpatient and outpatient billing codes. Yeah. Let me tell you, these psych wards are full of root beer and sugar and carbs. And there are kids just rotting away for weeks and weeks in there. And wow. uh, it is so sad. I hope I never go back. But yeah, that's all. It's like I would eat, I would drink like five of these root beers a day in the in the psych ward. You you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. I'll I'll tell you excitedly. I'm I'm treating someone right now who is inpatient psych, and we are implementing ketogenic therapies inpatient psych with video calls like this with the parents in one city, the patient in another city, and myself sitting in Michigan, and and he's doing it. Now we're not putting everything on a scale by any means. We started out with, can you stop eating sugar? And he said, yes. I mean, he was obviously motivated. And then we said, wow, when they have lasagna, can you order Chipotle? Because he can. And, you know, just these big, you know, big sweeping changes. And we got him a fridge in his room so we can have some pre-made keto meals in there. So, you know, just one thing at a time, it doesn't have to be yeah, everything measured perfect and exact. I mean, that's great when it can be, but you know, so that's, that's, um, we've had people in group homes that this is the first person I've started with, um, an actual inpatient psych and it's, it's great. He's doing very well. Everybody around him is noticing how well he's doing the caregivers, the nurses, the doctors, and we're thrilled. I had a similar experience with a, a young man that I was working with. Um, so he was in like a residential treatment center and pretty much he was on his own to order food. They didn't have a food service on uh, the grounds. So he would just order food out or he could, he could get groceries and make a meal if he wanted. Um, so, but he agreed to, actually he was on the diet before he was admitted. Um, and um, I had uh, worked with a dietitian. This is a, a kid in a different state. So I worked with a local dietitian who actually made his keto food for him and delivered it to him and put it in the refrigerator, put it in the freezer um, because and he, it was the only way it would work. He just had no access to anything and he wasn't about to go grocery shopping. He wasn't well enough to go out and do that kind of a thing. But yeah, it's it's these are the early days where we have to come up with these solutions. But again, I think in 10 years, we're gonna have centers that are focusing on this and putting entire, you know, the, the whole food service is gonna be involved in um, uh, transitioning over to real healthy food because hospital food right now is just uh, deplorable. It really is terrible to think, you know, you're going in the hospital to get well and you're being served a very high carb diet. As, as you talk about, you talk about kind of like grassroots and what's, what needs to change, you know, we also within our field with dietitians, many dietitians are not understanding of ketogenic therapy that is a, 
a valid therapy that's making life-changing differences. And that's something we're also working on that. And I'm meeting with a couple of other dietitians later this month to try to put together a little bit of a grassroots effort to hit all the, um, the dietetic associations across the country with um, perhaps a, you know, one, one set up um, talk, you know, that we can get a lot of people, you know, 15 people to try to get into all 50 states. And of course, and then wow, if we only get into 30, <laughs> that'd still be great, right? But trying to start some um, grassroots influence within our community, because we need these, you know, we need these dietitians on board to continue to train them. And so they can, um, in turn, do the therapy. I think one of the problems is there's no consensus about what you're supposed to eat anywhere in the entire world. No one knows. Are you supposed to eat vegan? People think you're supposed to be vegan, you know, carnivore, Mediterranean, you know, you can eat car. Okay. Complex carbs, brown rice, whatever. Yeah. Then the, the food pyramid obviously messed everyone up for, you know, hundred years, but no one knows. So, um, a big part of it is going to be to prove, I think the way, the way Chris frames it is really intelligent, which is that this is a, a, a metabolic treatment and that mm -hmm. fasting is really the way the treatment works, but we can mimic fasting with a keto diet. And that if we frame it that way, then we don't have to frame it as a diet per se, but we can treat it as a fasting metabolic treatment. And then keto is the vehicle by which we get there. And then and to extend that, Matt, there can be variations of the theme because we're able to modify it for a vegetarian. It's difficult to do a vegan, but vegetarian is workable. Um, we, we also have people with multiple food allergies. We have people that follow kosher. Um, we have people with feeding tubes. So um, Denise and I are, are queens of modifying keto for different, um, you know, not only preferences, but um, cultural biases, cultural needs, religious needs, and so forth. I mean, it can be done. Yeah. And the, also to add on to that is, is, yeah, there's no one, right, no one knows what diet you should be on, but I'd say this is, this is not a diet. This is your, this is your treatment. This is your Keppra. This is your medicine. And just like you don't go on and off medicine on, on a daily basis, you don't go on and off your therapy. And you're trying to encourage people that this is a med, again, the metabolic therapy, not their diet. Cause it's one thing to cheat on your diet. It's another thing to cheat on your medicine. And so we try to get that home to people that this is, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. I mean, and it's a serious intervention and coming off of it can have consequences and going on to it, people can have, we, we've noticed a lot of people that are doing this with bipolar or schizophrenia, they can have a kind of hypomania for the first three days. If you, we did this study, we we're looking at patient online reports and there was a lot of them reporting this kind of transition. So it needs to be managed really well with a psychiatrist and a dietitian to make it safe because we don't know the parameters of this with mental health fully yet. We're still working on the studies and we're doing our pilot trial at the moment and there's other sites doing this, but we're, we're learning about the kind of parameters of what's going to be safe with this. So we always recommend on this show, a dietitian and psychiatrist to, to support you in doing this metabolic therapy. That's a serious therapy that puts your body in a state of ketosis. Um, and so, so you've both developed resources as well that have really pushed this forward and um, with your diet calculator and you know it's reached I, I, I must be like tens of thousands of uh, dietitians and fitness and people working in this area are, are these have you got plans to bring some of could you bring some of these tools or are there, are there areas that we could try to um, benefit from what you've learned in metabolic psychiatry through like these uh, diet calculators and the apps and trainings that you provided and perhaps even if you could highlight some of the trainings you have at the moment for dietitians who are listening or people who would like to become dietitians, um, what, what can we learn? Um, Go ahead, Beth, why don't you tell about Keto Diet Calculator? So we've referred to Keto Diet Calculator a few times, especially in the beginning, um, and it is a program. I had no idea that it was going to grow the way it has. It was a program that I designed because I was bad at math. And um, my husband had fired me from managing the family checkbook. And I was going to be taking on calculating macronutrients for someone's treatment. I just, it, the, the idea of it just mortified me. So um, long story short, I worked with a programmer and coming up with um, setting up keto. It initially, was called Keto Calculator. Uh, and um, we eventually, um, it, 
morphed into this keto diet calculator that is used worldwide. It can be translated easily into other languages, but it's, it's intended for the nutritionist to have the initial login to help set up macros for a personalized diet. But then it also carries those macros forward to calculating complete meals. And it is the restrictive algorithm of the classic ketogenic diet. Um, and, and the way I approach my clients is by telling them that keto is not an intuitive diet. You don't easily think of, what am I gonna have for dinner on keto? When you start out, you don't. Eventually you think, you start thinking, it's kind of like learning a new language. You don't think in terms of sentences, you're starting to learn first words, right? These baby step words. And then you start stringing words together, um, like putting foods together to make a meal. So that's what Keto Diet Calculator offers is a starting point. And then eventually when it does get intuitive, you don't need to be using it anymore because everything is in, in metric, which no big deal if you live in Europe or the UK. <laughs> Actually the UK still uses the imperial system. It's, it's the Europeans and the Asians that use metric that find it so easy. Here in the US, people are a little taken aback by you know, the metric system that we use, and then they realize how easy it is and that we should have switched over in the 1970s like we were supposed to, to the mm -hmm. metric system. Um, at any rate, it's, it, foods are weighed in grams and you get, real, uh, you get quickly acclimated to weighing foods in grams and then visually eyeballing that amount. And it's super helpful because fat is so dense that you don't want to overshoot fat and you don't want to undershoot fat because that's the most important macro for getting ketosis, um, but so is protein. You don't wanna underscore your protein needs and you don't definitely need to eat too much. And then carbs, you know, you can, you can actually get quite a bit of great carbs on a liberal ratio. And a ratio just means the relationship of fat to non-fat, which is carbon protein. So keto diet calculator helps you to like balance all those macros and individualize the diet so that you are getting the results that you're hoping to get in terms of mitigating epilepsy or depression or migraines or whatever. Um, and it, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, I think some people think that we're micromanaging. Well, we are micromanaging because it's pretty amazing when you change a ratio that you get these results the next day of higher ketosis uh, with just a few tweaks in the grams of fat and the grams of carb. And I think that's what drew um, Denise and I and many of my colleagues into realizing how powerful this diet is because we have the ability to tweak these macros and change their degree of ketosis, change their metabolism, and then get better results. And um, you know that aha moment is um, quite amazing to know that you're helping somebody um, truly get better. So um, it's something, you know, I, I'm grateful for having it. I'm grateful for this programmer that just retired who I've been working with for over 20 years um, and the new person that I have. And uh, hopefully we'll be making some great upgrades to Keto Diet Calculator in the near future. Um, we're, we're ready for a big refresh, but, but I, uh, you know, a little commercial, it's available to license or registered nutritionists and then they can add unlimited patients or clients to their program and train those people and give them access to manage their diets. Um, and the program is free, um, uh, partly because the Charlie Foundation helps to sponsor it. So it's, you know, there's no cost, um, even though it costs us, um, I think about $80,000 a year to run it. So that, that's my little commercial. <laughs> Well, yeah, I can be a commercial for donating to the Charlie Foundation, those who appreciate yeah. the program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what an unbelievable resource that's been for people with epilepsy. It's just, you know, a free resource where you can figure everything out with your nutritionist. It is, is, has to benefit countless tens of thousands of people. So thank you for releasing that. And, and I hope that that will also be of use to people listening who are uh, doing this for mental health. You can use Keto Diet Calculator. We'll add a link in the description. Um, so if, if there's a lot of people uh, we speak to who want to become dietitians, even some of our past guests in the show have had these remission of symptoms and they want to become uh, dietitians, um, what could uh, what training resources that you uh, provide could you point to that would be good for people to look at? So as far as to actually become a registered dietitian or registered dietitian nutritionist, which is what Beth and I are, um, that's that's uh, basically a 
five to now seven programs requiring a master's degree as of 24. So um, that's a, a full, you know, bachelor's degree with, with, and then a master's and with usually now a combined internship. So it's very comprehensive and it's full training. And, you know, that training is food service and clinical nutrition all in one. So it's a, it's a lengthy process to become, to become a registered dietitian. I guess so as far as keto training, I mean, then go ahead. Oh yeah, I mean, many. Uh, so uh, Mia, who was one of our previous guests, she has uh, bipolar one, and she was over uh, twenty years and has gone into remission. And she said, "All I want to do in my life now is become a dietitian and help other people do this." For someone who's just starting out and looking into, is is there something you can do that qualifies you? What what would be the steps before going into the uh, formal degree, or is there something you could recommend for people at the very start of this process? What would you say, Beth? Yeah, um, so she so she is in her dietitian program. I'm sorry, I missed part of what you said, Ian. She's she wants to become a dietitian. Uh, she had oh. one, and she's uh, been unwell for 20 years and she's gone to remission. So we're trying to always connect with people and find yeah. out very much at the start of the journey, as far as I understand. And so I wondered if the uh, you know it's a huge journey to travel, obviously. But what what would be the first steps for say like young people listening or people like Mia that want to start out on this for the very first time? Yeah, she should take a keto mastery course. <laughs> this is the uh -huh. online course that Denise and I have designed. Um, we wrote it for nutritionists, but we've got physicians, nurses, um, even some lay people. I think somebody that you have interviewed recently even had taken our course. Um, she's a PhD scientist uh, because it's uh, it is really it's detailed, which is you know we're we're into details, we're into personalizing therapies. So we do go into you know not only macronutrients but micronutrients, um, laboratory studies. So it would be a, a really good exposure to you know what we do as dietitians if if she took the keto mastery course. Um, but also, you know, we're happy to field questions from people um, um, if they're just, you know, if they just want to ask, like, where could I go or to to get more exposure um, meetings. There's a great symposium coming up in uh, September of next year called um, um, Eighth Global Symposium on Ketogenic Metabolic Therapies, which started off for epilepsy and now has expanded way beyond epilepsy. and um, it's going to be in San Diego, California, about a year from now. That would be a good one to attend. But there's other conferences too that um, are good for getting foundational information. And uh, what you find when you go to these meetings is that you're with your people because you know they're exciting. There's excitement, and people want to support each other. And you know it's a great place to meet people to help um, you with networking. Awesome. We'll put a link to those in the description. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, uh, oh, I think we lost. Are you okay? Oh, sorry. I thought we'd, I thought we'd frozen there. I'll get it that out. Um, yeah. So, you know, Matt was saying about being in psych wards at the moment or in hospitals, you're given like energy drinks, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And there was a really famous uh, documentary that just came out in the UK about there's a mental health a psych ward and they were showing the abuse that was happening to people there. It was really shocking um, what was happening to people in there. But going back into history, the way they used to treat bipolar was with uh, metabolic therapy per se, but that was just injecting us with insulin until we went unconscious, you know? Like they oh, didn't saw that. <laughs> Man, like, can you imagine anything worse? Um, so, I mean, they've been doing that and we would prioritize treatments like this, like insulin shock therapy or even lobotomy for a long time over changing someone's diet. And to me, this is so tragic. It's like the number of people that were lobotomized and put through electroconvulsive, you know, they would put you through insulin shock therapy and then electroconvulsive therapy. And we're not quite in that Newtonian age, but there's still a lot of dangers and risks for people that are um unfortunately in the mental health care system to being you know given things that are not in their best interest and that's why we're so passionate about talking about this because you're very vulnerable as someone with a mental health condition to being told you have to do this and you have to undergo this and oftentimes they won't want to argue or they won't know what to say 
Um, so I guess this is the reason why we're so, uh, you know, excited to talk to you about how this could change because we, we know people that have gone through this stuff and it's really not, um, and Matt's gone through a psych ward himself. I've been fortunate to stay out of a psych ward, but it's really, um, yeah, it's just, it's just tragic what happens to people. My own experience that was closer to taking Lamotrigine and seeing how much it suppressed my function and made me suicidal. And, and I'm not saying that doesn't work for a lot of people, it does. Uh, but for me, it was it made me much worse. And the side effects of drugs are very severe for bipolar for a lot of people. So um, we, we really want to see this um, come about. Um, I, I guess I guess I just wanted to ask how, um, you know, we need to pause, we need to have the training for dietitians, and we need to have all these pieces in place for this to happen. Um, what would you say is the role of patients in this who are worried about their treatment and worried about side effects and they want to try different things? How can they be effective in getting demand from psychiatrists, from uh, uh, you know, training for dietitians, for getting these charge codes for dietitians to use? What, what can we do as patients that's going to be really helpful for this? Or what have you seen in epilepsy that's really made this happen? Well, we recommend anybody um, who is seeking uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy for epilepsy or any condition where there has been, you know, some positive results, um, prospective studies, or even case series. Um, first, you know, first bring that information to your physician, preferably in an article so that they can't refute it. Um, but then tell your doctor, if you can't provide this for me here, tell me, where can I go? And, you know, if the physician can't do it, um, we have great resources on the Charlie Foundation website of global centers that do keto. We don't have them all. We try to keep on top of the ones we know about and keep that updated. We also have a list of professionals. And I know there's other lists too. Um, Dr. E works with people. Um, there's a doctor named Matt Bernstein who's going to be opening a clinic soon who Denise and I will be training staff for. We just had a discussion about that today um, on the East Coast here in the US. But you know, there's pockets of these places around the world. You have to do a little digging to find out, um, but you can pursue this. Um, but the important thing is don't try it on your own because there can be um, adverse effects. And uh, in my travels, it's really interesting when I'm out traveling and somebody, you know, strikes up conversation with me or we get talking about what we do for a living and I explain that I'm keto. I work in the keto field. My email also has keto in the name. So if I'm giving my email address right away, people pick up that I work in the keto world. Um, and I often get these horrible stories um, frequently from people who have tried keto on their own. I tried it for three months. I felt terrible the whole time, you know, and, and they weren't doing it right. You know, it's not that keto didn't work. They weren't doing it right. Um, so there can be there can be can be a bad keto diet as well as a really healthy one. And you can thrive on keto for many years. The first patient that I started working with is still on it. Um, for epilepsy, we tend to use it for short periods or at least the most restrictive version of it for short periods and then wean off into a more liberal form. Um, but you can thrive on it for the rest of your life if you need to, it's that healthy as long as it's providing you with all of your essential nutrients. And let me just say that since I went on the diet, I've gained muscle mass, gained strength, um, less brain fog. I can hold like a 20, 30 minute tour de France pace on my Peloton. Mm -hmm. Like this, this will not hinder your cognitive function, your athletic performance in the long term, even like even strength goals, you know, which are not endurance, but strength goals. Like I've I've gotten a lot stronger on the diet and I'm sure Don will speak to this when we, when we talk to him, but this is not some sort of, uh, this is not going to hinder your performance in either of those um, parts of your life at all, or in my, in, I should say, in my experience, it has not hindered mine. Yeah. And going back to also what, you know, patients said, what can they do with their doctors? It's, it's, and that's a huge difficult issue, Ian, that you mentioned because people, they go in, they pre even presenting information, sometimes really run up against these roadblocks. And that's where Beth saying, you know, pockets are coming up. And she mentioned a couple, there's a, a physician, a psychiatrist at University of Toledo, um, who's going to be starting a clinic at the end of next summer. 
and that's exciting. And he's, you know, he's like, and I hope five of my colleagues are going to be doing the same, you know, and it's all growing out of the meta metabolic psychiatry meeting that we had um, back in May in Santa Barbara. So, you know, they're growing they're, and as people grow and as these people do it, um, you know, if, when we build it, they will come. Right. But I think people just have to be persistent with their own position and, and just as they have people successful and then they have to go away from their position to find a different one, you know, then, then so be it. But again, that, that, um, is, is, um, hindered by cost for a lot of people and that's, what's frustrating. So hopefully we can get volume up. So the cost can come down for people, because that's, again, it's cost prohibitive for, for people to pay, or, you know, a lot of people to pay Beth and I as private practice dietitians, it's expensive. So more group things are going to be coming down the pike as well to try and get costs down. Awesome. We've just done uh, six o'clock. I want to be respectful of your time, but are there any, um, what would be the best place to find uh, your materials online for people that want to, um, to find out about your work, to take your training courses? Okay. So that pro is the website, right? Oh, Charlie.org is another great website. Denise and I both have our own website, so you can just Google our names. And I, one final word, this is something I don't think got really clarified, but there isn't one ketogenic diet. There's variations of keto. You can be on a very liberal ketogenic diet. You can be on a very restrictive ketogenic diet. You can be on one that you weigh every gram of food out. You can be one that you don't weigh anything out at all. That's very loosely managed. So this spectrum of ketogenic metabolic therapies is you know, available, especially by somebody who has been experienced in using them. And I oftentimes see um, in articles that you know the ketogenic diet has side effects. Well, what ketogenic diet are you talking about? Because a five to one ketogenic diet probably has side effects, but a one to one, no. So you know you want to talk to somebody that really knows their stuff and has some experience. And that, yeah, to piggyback on that with a lot of times when physicians, when they've heard what they have heard about the diet, is the four to one classic ketogenic therapy, which is you know much very difficult to do and not even recommended for adults at all, and does have more side effects, especially when implemented over a two day period, which is going to make everybody sick. So, yeah, they uh, we call it WFKD, a well formulated ketogenic diet, right? And I think I think we I think we I think Verta Health came up with that phrase. And anyway, so with that, with a diet that is prescribed for you, you don't just give someone, you know, if they need Keppra or they need Lamotrigine, you don't just give them the full out highest dose available to man. No, of course you start them at a low dose and you would incrementally increase. And that's what we do with our therapies. And so, yeah, it's really, uh, it's really frustrating sometimes just the, the genuine ignorance that we run across because they just, they see something and then they keep reference, referencing old articles or old studies or, you know, just old information that's untrue. And we run across this, oh, it's infuriating. And, you know, with keto for cancer and some other therapy, you know, other conditions where it's very helpful. And we're, we're fighting against some very old um, bases, people saying that, wow, this diet's so dangerous, you know, the side effects of the medications that you know you guys have experienced are untenable very often, and and just and I'll just I just want to piggyback on this because I have a client who is losing weight at an astounding rate um, on keto. Um, well, he had gained a hundred pounds at an astounding rate, and they're very upset about how quickly he's losing, and he is losing too fast for my for my comfort, right? But I but my thought is. Who was standing by saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, he's gained 20 pounds. Oh my gosh, he's gained 40 pounds, 60, 80, 100 pounds. No one was standing there taking care of him and stopping that metabolic crisis. Nobody. And now that it's coming down, they're all freaked out. And again, it is coming down pretty fast. But you know what? I don't know exactly how quickly it went on, but I know for a lot of people, it comes on very fast with the medications and psych in psychiatric conditions. So I'm just feel I just feel like, wow, where were you when he was on his way up? And now we're a lot crying. of a lot of these meds have an adverse effect on insulin sensitivity. You have to wonder 
whether they might be doing more harm than good in the long term in some cases probably not i mean you know for a short term i I mean they can be incredibly effective but that's a dangerous thing when a medication is messing with your insulin sensitivity well and i believe and i know dr palmer has given great information on this in some of his talks about and is it is it 15 to 20 years off the average life i mean it was a tremendous amount of you know years loss and lifespan for patients with psychiatric conditions because you know largely because of the metabolic dysfunction which is largely because of the medications so yeah it's it's amazing can't tell you how happy it <clears throat> made me when we were writing side effects for you know doing a ketogenic diet for a trial that you might lose some weight you know you might feel a lot better you know it's like all of the psychiatric medications are like you will probably put on a lot of weight you'll have metabolic dysfunction it's like they were just people are amazed when i was recruiting for this trial they're like did you get this right did you mistype this we're, we're gonna lose weight as a side effect because oh, so many people you know it's two to three times the rate of diabetes and bipolar everyone's struggling with obesity and eating disorders and all kinds of things so it's a it's a great side effect sometimes as long as it- <laughs> yeah um, yeah. So, and, and, and just to, to the point on uh, like medications and insulin sensitivity, it's a really difficult picture because like you say, so many of these are contributing to like reduction of insulin sensitivity and so, well, you know, they're, they're clearly having metabolic comorbidity effects that we don't want. Um, but then there's also weird things that happen with uh, lithium where we just put out a paper showing that lithium is in mouse models increasing glucose metabolism in the brain and it's showing and it, it works on many of the parts of this insulin signaling pathway. So it's like you're saying there's these short-term effects and long-term effects where short-term you can get improvements, but then long-term they damage your kidneys, your liver, and then you know you can end up with diabetes insipidus. So, so in the short-term, they're showing in mice models that you can improve glucose metabolism in the brain with lithium, and in the long-term, it's damaging the liver and giving them diabetes. So it's a really... Yeah, it's a very, but, but, you know, and keto bypasses a lot of these issues, but, um, but I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, you've really pioneered this whole ketogenic metabolic therapy for epilepsy and now for uh, psychiatric conditions and your work with Matt and now with the Bazooki group is leading to this whole field being regenerated. So thank you very much for speaking to us. And I hope we've learned a lot and people listening have learned so much from uh, this conversation. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for having us.